What's going on, guys? We're back for Hostile Q&A number three. And I appreciate you guys subscribing and watching. The timestamps are in the description below. So you guys don't have to watch the whole thing to see what questions are where. And I also just want to take a minute to express my thanks for the support in the podcast. Now, I just want to tell you guys why I started the podcast to begin with. There are a lot of fringe voices in bodybuilding, and I don't believe they speak for the actual bodybuilders. You have a lot of people that say, oh, I know this bodybuilder, he does this. I know that bodybuilder, he does that. It's all kind of secondhand bullshit. And then you have a lot of a lot of people that don't even know any pros, and they just say, this is what the pros are doing, and they kind of give you this bullshit rundown of their stack, which is some insane thing that I've never seen. I wanted to have the pros on to actually speak for themselves and give you guys an idea of who they really are so it's not secondhand anymore. I have a real conversation, an hour long, maybe more, and let these people really express themselves. And I want to give them a platform to kind of sit down and say, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. This is what I do for fun. This is what I don't do for fun. This is what my family's like. I want to give you guys a real idea of who they are and not just some secondhand bullshit that some guy said. That isn't really true. So hopefully I'm achieving that. Uh, so far, like I said, the comments have been great. And um, I feel like it can be something really popular. And that's not why I started it. I actually just like, I'm a fan of the sport as well. So I like talking to these guys and kind of getting a sense of what they're doing and how they're doing and and how they've gone about making a success out of their out of their career like how they built success out of bodybuilding because a lot of people don't know how to do that so i feel like if i can bring that to you it'll help some of you guys coming up and learning seeing and hearing some of their pitfalls so you can avoid them yourself anyway let's get into this q a we have a lot of questions i don't know how many i'm going to be able to answer and if i do answer all of them uh, it's probably going to be a two-parter so this will be part one let's get to it Polly P66 says the effects of big eating on your body and dealing with it after competing is over. There are probably a lot of effects uh, and I might miss some, but I will say this being this big for a long period of time is probably unhealthy. People point to steroids a lot for a lot of different ailments, but I actually believe that the amount of food we're eating, the type of food we're eating, and the size that we carry for the amount of time we're carrying it is probably more detrimental than the steroids themselves. I don't believe that doing testosterone uh, is that harmful. Probably some of the other drugs, at least, uh, especially some of the orals are probably more toxic, definitely has more effect on the body. But still, I believe just carrying around 250 pounds of muscle for 10, 15, 20 years is probably more detrimental on the system because you have to feed that muscle too. So for example, being that big is probably going to raise your blood pressure. That's going to have effect on your kidneys. Eating 10 to 12 ounce portions, eight to 10 to 12 ounce portions of meat or poultry or whatever, uh, you know, four or five, six times a day is going to have effect on your kidneys. Eating tons of white starch and simple sugar is could cause fatty liver, diabetes, insulin resistance. Uh, with insulin resistance, you have a whole host of other problems like sleep apnea, sleep, you have insomnia, and uh, there's a host of things that could go wrong uh, if you're not careful. Even if you are careful, they could still go wrong. The way we minimize these things, or the way I, at least I go about minimizing these things, I try and see my doctor twice a year. And twice a year, I ask for a blood panel of liver, kidney, uh, A1C, which is my sugar levels, like your diabetic chart, I guess. Thyroid, uh, test levels. And once every two years, I get my heart checked. I didn't start the heart thing till probably after 30. But uh, I definitely recommend, if you've been bodybuilding for a while, it doesn't really matter your age. Once every couple of years, you should get your heart checked, either with an EKG angiogram if you want more serious a more serious look uh, calcium scoring is another way to get a good look at your at your heart and how it's performing um, but once every couple of years have these things checked and with your blood work with your other organs at least once every six months 
Because when you start seeing a trend, if a trend starts going downwards, you can start to make changes and your body will regenerate itself pretty quickly. Even your kidneys now uh, are being shown to regenerate with certain uh, minerals. So Dante Trudell just posted a, a good article or a good post on astragalus, for example. It's good for kidney regeneration. So hopefully I'll have Dante on the podcast one day. He can discuss more about it. But that's... Um, that's the way we want to stay healthy is to always make sure we're watching the trend, keep getting your blood work done, watch the trend. When the trend, see the problem people run into is when the trend starts going down, they're like, well, I don't want to go off the juice because if I go off the juice, I'm going to shrink. You're not going to fucking shrink. You're going to lose some water. You're going to lose some glycogen. You're going to lose some strength. Most of your muscle will return pretty quickly as long as it's hard earned muscle and you built it like with real fucking training. I'm not talking muscle muscle that you built in three months. That three months is probably water and glycogen. I'm talking if you've had muscle for a couple of years, two, three, four years, and you go off, depending on how long you go off, you're not going to lose all that muscle. You're going to lose a whole ton of water. You're going to lose a whole bunch of glycogen. You're probably not going to be able to eat as much while you're off and all these things, but it's better than destroying your kidneys or destroying your liver or doing, you know what I mean? Like you have to, it has to be calculated if you're going to do this thing for, for the long term. So those are some of the things we look at when we get blood work done. Those are some of the things I am concerned about or people should be concerned about in their life after bodybuilding and why this is why when you're like in your fifth year of bodybuilding, you're starting out or you're, you know, halfway through, you should start to really get these things monitored so that you don't have too many problems when bodybuilding is done with. On to the next question. John 1471 says, what do I do if my testosterone is low in your mid twenties, but you don't want to go on TRT and natural test boosters haven't done anything. We don't really have a choice. I don't think living with low testosterone is a, a good thing. I mean, having low testosterone causes mood swings, causes lack of sleep, it causes low sex drive, obviously uh, loss of appetite your training is going to be shit. So I, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you there's a bunch of food you can eat that are going to raise your testosterone. There is, but if you have genetically low testosterone, if you have some type of uh, issue where you need to get it corrected, eating fucking scallops is not going to fix that. So if the doctor tells you, hey, the solution is probably to go on TRT, uh, I'm not sure what your reservation is against it, but I would suggest doing it. And if it's just because of the needles, uh, there, there are testosterone creams and things like that you can use to help elevate your testosterone. But I would talk to your doctor for more, more about it and um, figure out what your other options are because living with low testosterone is not as, it might be uncomfortable doing a shot if that's what the problem is, but it's a lot more uncomfortable living with low testosterone. So you kind of got to weigh your options there. Kevin mounts in your opinion for a young, someone who works out and has a good physique, but is just starting out on social media. What tips would you give for getting sponsors and getting your name out there? What quality content people are into to help grow their social media? That depends on you. I can't tell you what people like and what people don't like. I don't even know. <laughs> you know, sometimes you could post a video and it could get 100,000 views and you could post the same video a month later and it could get 10,000 views. So, you know, what people want changes from time to time. And it's not for me to tell you what people want. It's for you to figure out because I can't tell you what you have to offer people. You have to figure out, this is how you get sponsors. You get sponsors by being valuable. And you become valuable by offering something to them that nobody else can offer. So that means, okay, I have 100,000 followers. Why are they following you? Is it because you're funny? Is it because you're interesting? Is it because you post really, really great photos? You have a great physique? Is it because you're offering a ton of information? Is it because you're motivating in some way? You have to figure out what your formula is. Like, I'll give you an example. People follow me. They tell me, I, I'm not going to be arrogant enough to think I know, but people tell me they follow me because uh, I have a certain like aggressive attitude that motivates them. 
uh, or it's because I'm offering some type of information via training videos or whatever else. People don't follow me because I'm funny. You know what I mean? Like people follow Antoine, for example, they follow people follow Antoine because he's hilarious or because he's a great physique. He's just really interesting. He's always doing weird shit. Uh, people follow Seth Ferrosi, for example, because he's real. He tells it how it is and he's fucking, he's fun and he's a family man and you can really relate to that, right? People follow Frank McGrath because he's that iconic bodybuilder and all the photos and people really want to identify with that bodybuilder because they grew up watching Frank and he's got all the show me body parts, like the big arms and the big chest, the big forearms and people like that shit. So everybody has a thing, right? Everybody has a thing that will make you aspire to want to follow them or will make you want to aspire to be like them or, or be motivated by them. You have to figure out what you have to offer people. Um, and sometimes it takes a long time to figure that out. You know, you're not going to put, if you put one post up about nutrition and nobody likes it, it doesn't mean that's not your thing. It just means sometimes it takes time to get traction. I mean, look, my YouTube example, my YouTube is a perfect example. I got, I, I started my YouTube channel again this year with 27,000 subscribers or some, something like that. When I look around the industry, people have like 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. I'm like, holy shit, I'm way behind. But it's because I haven't been active. I haven't been focused on it. I haven't given it enough time to get traction. So I'm like, okay, I do the podcast thing. You do the podcast thing. Some people like it. Okay, people like it. I'll keep doing that. See if it gets traction. See if people enjoy it. See if people want to listen. Do the Q&A thing. People want to listen. Do some training videos. See if people like them. They want to follow them. Do some, do some cooking videos. See if people like those and they want to follow them. It's kind of a big experiment. You have to try different things and see what people like. Don't look at so-and-so. And go, that guy's posting a lot of training videos. I'm going to post a lot of training videos. That might not be your thing. It might not give you the following. It's giving that other guy. Hey, that guy's really funny. I'm going to try and be really funny and see. You might not be funny. People might not think you're funny. You might be copying that guy. Maybe, but if it doesn't, the one thing I've realized about social media is the people who do the best are usually the people who are the most genuine. Or if they're faking it, they're really good at faking it. So whatever you're doing, my advice is to be as genuine as possible and as real as possible. And I think that's the way to build a real fan base where people can trust you and they believe what you're saying and they identify with you because you're being honest with them. So going back to your question, it's find the thing that you do best and do it a lot. Do it a lot. Don't don't kill people. Don't blow their phones up with your videos. But have a routine. Stay consistent. And just watch your fan base grow. Start networking with other people. And, and watch your fan base. And as your fan base grows, then you can begin to ask sponsors. Hey, can I be an ambassador? Hey, can I be an athlete? Hey, you know, is there an internship somewhere in your company that I can fit into? Like, sometimes starting at the bottom and working your way up is still a thing. So... Just my advice, find what you love, find what identifies you and show people and see if they gravitate towards it. Okay, guys, next question is from DePontani. DePontani? Oh, wait, sorry if I'm butchering these. Do you use a logbook? And if not, how do you track your progress? So I had this little debate with Dante Trudell on his page because Dante is an avid user, an avid, uh, he he wants all his clients and anybody he can talk to 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 use a logbook because it's worked for him. And I do think it's valuable. I mean, look, Dorian Yates used one. There's lots of people that use logbooks and I think they are valuable. I think it is good to track your progress and know where you've been so you know where you're going. That being said, I just wanna beat what I had last week. And I feel like if you can't remember what you did last week, then there's a problem. And I know if I did 315 on the bench last week for eight, I can remember that. So I know this week I need to do 315 again for nine or 10 or whatever. So that's 
one way to look at it. The second thing is once you reach a certain point, it's not really about weight anymore. Like you're not just going to keep lifting more and more and more weight until you're fucking dead. There's going to be a point where you hit a plateau. Like I've never squatted more than 550. Okay. Um, now I squat four, four Oh five for reps. I don't need to keep a log book to remember that I did four Oh five, 15 times last week. I just know I want to do four Oh five, at least 15 times this week. And I don't need to keep a log book because I'm not ever going to lift more than five plates. So what's the log book for? Now, the place where I can see it being valuable, and I'm not saying it's not valuable, but for me, it, it just hasn't been a thing. But the place where I see it valuable being valuable is when you look at long-term trends. So through the month of October and November, I ate this way, and I lifted like this, and this is how the numbers went and up and down. Looking back on my career, there are some things I could have done differently in having a logbook may have changed things. It may have helped me, but only if it coincided with logging my diet as well. Because I feel like if you're just logging your training, it's not, it's not the whole story. Because if you lift it a certain way, it could be because you're eating a certain way. So I think a logbook is valuable if you add the diet to it so that you can really know what's going on. And then I would say, yeah, I think it's a good idea. I wish sometimes I would have had one, but I also don't know if I care. Uh, I think I made out pretty good without it. I think I still added 10 pounds of muscle a year uh, on my way up, and I still think I'm still developing muscle now, even at 40. So I don't feel like not having a logbook has held me back. You never know. I mean, maybe I could have been a top six Olympian if I had a logbook and I wrote everything down and it was perfect. But I'm pretty happy with the way my career has turned out without a logbook. So you still will make progress without a logbook. I think if you want to be perfect, if you want to be Dorian Yates crazy, if you want to be uh, that really militant bodybuilder, I never could get there myself personally. I always worked hard, but I never could get to that place where I was writing down every gram of rice and every set and rep and every, it was never me. Um, but yeah, I think there's a benefit to doing that. If you can, if you can really nail everything perfectly and jot it all down. So you know what your trends are and how to get big and how, how you got there. Diego Vasquez 14 says, in your opinion, what is the best way to begin enhanced bodybuilding after you have a good natural base should your first three to four cycles be strictly about size and using bulking PEDs or just go by look and feel? This is going to be a short answer because I stated the answer to this in my last uh, Q&A and I know a lot of you guys are not going to like this answer. I don't really see the use for PEDs unless you're competing. If you are... Look, we all know there's, there's steroids in all sports and if you don't, your head's in the sand. If you're trying to get to the NFL, the NHL, the NBA, whatever whatever professional sport, right? If you're trying to get to the, the top of whatever sport you're in, and you know the rest of the group is doing the same thing you're doing, so you're not cheating, then that's your thing. That's what, that's what gives you the decision, right? That's where your decision is. If you want to compete as a bodybuilder, that's what my decision was. I didn't. I didn't sit and research every single drug on earth. I didn't, I knew that I knew the precaution. I knew, I knew the risks. I knew the risks. I, I did research that. Um, I didn't build a natural base. I went to a bodybuilding show at 20 years old. I didn't start bodybuilding until 20. I, I used to just do cardio. I just wanted to stay in shape. I was like a little men's physique guy. Not to knock men's physique. I was like a little men's health guy, okay? You know, men's health magazine? Like, that's what I looked like. Um, I went to a bodybuilding show at 20 years old, and I saw it, and the next day I decided to want to be a bodybuilder. I was like, you know what? I can fucking do that. A friend of mine dared me to do it. I was like, I'm going to do our local show in a year and a half. And that's when I started because it was for a purpose. 
I, I never ever have been an advocate of doing PEDs just to like be bigger as a bouncer or, or pick up chicks or look good at the bar or whatever bullshit. Maybe if you're doing photo shoots or something, if you want to be a fitness model, I guess I could see the the point there, but like, I, I, I don't, it's whatever your decision is. It, it has to be valuable because I don't think doing them just for the sake of doing them is, is smart now. And I, and when you do start, I don't think it matters like, Oh, well, should my first three or four cycles be bulking? Not if it's not your objective. If you weigh 180 pounds already and you're like, I want to be a fitness model, you don't really got to be too much bigger. So why would you do a bunch of bulking cycles? You're going to do the cycles that are dependent on what your goal is. So it's all like a well thought out thing. Okay. I want to be a bodybuilder. So what should my first cycle be? Well, I'm small. I want to get big. What should my, you know, I'm going to start slow and let my body develop. Okay. I want to be a fitness model. Okay. Well, I weigh 200 pounds already. Well, I don't need a bulking cycle. I'll just start on a cutting cycle. I'll get ready for a photo shoot. What your first cycle is is going to depend what your goals are. If your goal is to look good at the fucking bar, go do it naturally. Don't, I, I'm not an advocate of PEDs just to look good at the beach. So if that offends anybody, I apologize, but I feel like it's a pretty serious thing and it does have consequences. And if you're not doing it for any specific reason or getting anything back from it, and it's just to boost your ego, I just don't see, I just don't see the benefit. The risk reward is, is not there. Okay, John Engman says, I was wondering about different intercity intercity for different muscle groups. For example, do you believe in hitting the bicep or the rear delt as hard and as often as example, chest or quads? Oh, so you're saying, do you believe in hitting small muscle groups as often or hard as bigger? No, I don't. You're going to hit bigger muscle groups a lot harder. I'm going to hit quads a lot harder than I'm going to hit biceps. And one, it's because it's in bigger muscle groups. So I have to tax it way harder. But two, it's because my biceps are probably being worked when I do back or chest or any, like when you're doing a lot of upper body compound movements, your arms are getting worked. So when I hit biceps, if I hit back the day before, I don't need to kill my biceps the way I'm going to kill my quads. So no, I don't believe in hitting small muscle groups the same way or to the same degree or to the same failure rate. Uh, smaller muscle groups I have learned over time that actually respond better to moderate weight, uh, with a higher rep range f to failure. So for biceps, for example, I used to go really, really heavy in the six to eight range. And I'd get a lot of tendon pain in my bicep, bicep tendons. And same thing for triceps. In my tricep tendons, my elbows got really bad. And what I learned lately and what happened to my arm, my arms kind of grew was it was after I reduced the weight to a moderate level, I would still go to failure, but failure would be 12 to 15. So what was failing was the muscle, not like the tendon. Like the tendons were doing all the work, if that makes any sense. I know it's not scientifically right, but it felt like all the load was on my tendons. And when I reduced the weight, reduced, but still went to failure, but just at a higher rep range. So I didn't have to lift as much weight. The muscle actually responded more. And I feel like that works better for smaller muscle groups like biceps, triceps, shoulders. The only thing I really go heavy on shoulders on is military press, but that's still relative because I'm still getting 10 to 12 reps. So, um, yeah, you're going to hit bigger muscle groups in a different way. It's it bigger muscle groups to me need heavy weight compound movements. Sometimes you're going to hit them twice a week, depending on recovery rates. Um, so all that, all that stuff kind of plays into it. So yeah, there, there is a difference in the way you're going to train different muscle groups. Uh, Tim Klo says, do you ever regret not staying natural? No, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> no, just the reason I'm saying no is because I, like I said before in a previous answer, 
I started for a specific reason to become a pro bodybuilder, or at least at the time it was to win my first pro show. So I don't regret it because I could not have won without it. And I would not have turned pro without it. So at least not, I'm not saying you can't, I'm saying with my genetics, I don't think I would have naturally. So I'm sure there's guys out there with way better genetics that, you know, could turn pro naturally or have won shows naturally that weren't natural shows, but that wasn't me. So I don't regret my decision. It was for a specific purpose. It served the purpose. It still serves the purpose. Uh, and when I'm done competing, it will no longer be part of my life. So no, no regrets. Mark Zizulka says, what foods are essential to your diet? Do you do meal plans yourself or does someone still do them? Uh, the foods that are essential to my life are just bodybuilding foods. The standard foods, chicken, steak, uh, ground beef, tuna, white fish, egg whites, eggs, rice, potatoes, oatmeal, cream of rice, pasta. That's it. Just like 10 foods that I eat like all the time. And then I have a cheat meal two, three times a week. Right. But those 10 foods are like the foods I eat all the time. They're always there. Those are the staples in my diet. And uh, as far as coaches go, uh, I generally have done almost all of my off seasons by myself because I know how to get a surplus of food. And, and I feel like I have a good idea of how my body grows. Where I have a coach is usually in a diet phase. When I'm prepping for a contest, I have somebody help me set up my diet plan. And I think I could do it on my own. I just get a little fucking scatterbrained when I'm really hungry. So I have somebody to kind of keep an eye on me. And I think John, you know, I work with John Meadows most recently. And for most of my career in the later years, I've worked with a lot of coaches. But John has probably been the most significant coach of my life. Um, he has a good handle on how my brain works. So we work very well together that way. Uh, next question. I'm not sure what this name is. Nacio Alvarez. Nacio Alvarez says, what is the perfect ratio for macros? 40, 40, 20. Uh, pretty much. That's it. Off season. Off season, my ratio is 40, 40, 20, or sometimes 45, 45, 10. Um, but 40, 40, 20 seems to work very, very well for me. But there's no such thing as a perfect ratio. There's a million different ways to put on muscle, right? Like you could be keto, put on muscle. You could be on a very, very, like one year I was on a very high fat diet. Like I think I was on like a, it was almost like a, a 40, 40, 20, but the 20 was carbs. And I put on a lot of muscle that year. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to do this. Um, I'm not going to say there's any perfect one. I personally like the 40, 40, 20, the best for the off season, the 40% 40 protein, 40% carbs, 20% fat, because it gives me a nice variety of everything. I don't feel like my protein's too high that way because I feel like if your protein's too high, I could fuck with your appetite and it's not necessarily that healthy. I feel like if your carbs are too high past 40, you just probably start to get a little bit fatter and you know, you're not going to control water weight and all that shit. And I think if your fats are too high, it can fuck with your appetite also. It can really, really crush your appetite quickly. So I think at 20, it's safe. I can still get some avocados in. I can still get some red meat in, but I'm not like dousing everything and eating tons of peanut butter and totally crushing my appetite. So 40, 40, 20 works very well for me. If I'm dieting, I'm probably getting into like a 50, 30, 20, um, maybe even like 50, 25, 25, uh, as I go 50% protein, 25 carbs, 25 fat. So things change as you're dieting, right? But in the off season, a 40, 40, 20 is, is pretty accurate as far as my favorite split or my favorite macro split. Next question. Michael Shabilsky says, any advice on how to overcome anxiety at the gym, like getting too caught up and concerned with who might see you there or what they think you look like while you train? I know this might sound stupid, but sometimes I can see somebody I know 
at the gym and I can't seem to focus on my sets. Well, I know what anxiety is like, but I don't know what it's like at the gym because the gym is kind of my sanctuary. So if we're talking about anxiety, I'm usually talking about it at the bank or in a meeting somewhere with executives or something along those lines. I, I don't think I've ever felt anxiety in the gym, but I don't think it's anything any different than anything else. If I had anxiety in the gym, the first thing I would do is find a gym that wasn't super busy. Because if you have trouble with people watching you, it's going to affect your training. Find a gym that's not so busy. So that's step one. Step two, I would find a time in the day when the gym's not as busy. Don't go at five o'clock. You know, you know the gym is going to be rammed from four to seven. Go in the morning. Go early, you know, before work or whatever. You know what I mean? Or go late before bed. Go nine o'clock. Go five in the morning. Do whatever you have to do so that you're there when there's not a shitload of people there. That's what I would do anyway. That's step two. Step three, loud music and lots of clothes is what I would do. Because usually if feel if people if you feel like people are staring at you, it's because you're probably wearing a tank top or you're wearing a sleeveless shirt or you're wearing some short shorts or something. I don't know. You're wearing something that's showing your body or something and it might make you feel like people are staring at you. If you go in the gym and you're wearing a pair of warm-ups and a hoodie, I don't think people give a shit because they can't see much anyway. Not to mention you can put your hoodie up and your fucking hat down and then you can't see anybody anyway. So these are the things I would do if I had anxiety in the gym to kind of protect myself. First, go to a gym where there's not a lot of people. Probably a hardcore gym would be best. Go at times when it's not really, really busy and stay covered up. Put, a, put your hat down over your eyes, man. I feel like if people can't see me, I can't see them. So my hat is low, my hoodie's up, and I'm training. and I'm just focused on what I'm doing. Give that a shot. See if it works. Juan Flores 21 says, do you have any cheat days or meals? If so, then how often are they and what do you eat? I have in the off season, usually two or three cheat meals a week. Usually one is a burger and fries. The other one is sushi and the other one is pizza. I usually have pizza once a week. Pizza is usually reserved for Saturday night watching a UFC fight. I'll get some pizza and ice cream. That's probably the shittiest cheat that I have. Uh, during the week, in the middle of the week, usually Wednesday, I'll have like either five guys. I'll have like a burger, fries, or two burgers and fries, and then or I'll have sushi on that day. Usually it's two a week, um, but if I have a third, I'll have a third whenever the fuck I want. But those are usually my go-tos for cheat meals. If I want to do a cleaner cheat where it's like not really a cheat but I'm eating out, uh, I'll hit Swiss chalet, which is like a Canadian, like Boston market. Like they have rotisserie chicken and stuff there. I just like, kind of like it when people cook for me. So I'll go there, I'll get like half a chicken and some rice. And it's not really like a super cheat, but it's not homemade. So it feels like I'm cheating. You can always do things like that too, because sometimes we just want, sometimes it's just nice to have food made for you. It's better than the same old shit that we make at our house. So your best option is to find cheat meals that aren't really cheat meals. Find a place that makes bodybuilding friendly food but tastes better than your own food that's really the holy grail uh next question michael shabilsky you already asked a question but i'll answer this second one anyway do you have any advice on getting mentally focused before a workout or things you might tell yourself to mentally get to that point that place uh, yeah, I don't want to fucking lose. When I'm going to the gym, I'm going to the gym for a purpose. I love to train and I love to get after it. And I love to put my body through fucking hell. And at the end of it all, I'm chasing a purpose. I want to get to a place where I can be proud of what I've created and I can step on stage with my peers and compete. So what I tell myself before I get to the gym, it's not just before I get to the gym that kind of starts, it kind of starts in the morning when I wake up or even the night before sometimes, you know, I, I, I might wake up the morning of a back day and be like, you know, as I get up, I sit down on the toilet and I'm like, today's back day. Okay. What do I got to do today? And I start to kind of plan out what I'm going to do then. By the time I get to the gym, I've already seen the workout in my head things might change while I'm going. I might be like, Oh, you know what? I kind of feel this feels really good. I might do more sets, but 
it's kind of something I just do. It's not like, I'm not trying to say I plan it. I don't wake up thinking about what I'm going to do, but just throughout the day, you know, I might go, I go to the gym usually after my second meal. I get up, I go to the gym, I do cardio, come home, have two meals. Right when I wake up, before I've gone for cardio, I'm already thinking, okay, today's back day. What do I feel like doing today? I definitely want to get some barbell rows in. Definitely want to get some T-bar rows in. Okay, those are in there. I'm going to put them in there somewhere. Okay, but I got to got to work on my lat width a little bit. So, oh, maybe I'll hit the reverse hammer strength pull down today. That'll feel really good. Okay, I'm going to throw that in there. And as I go through the day, before that, before I get to the gym, I've kind of pieced together three or four exercises I really want to do. It's kind of my workout. And then if I want to add a fifth exercise, I will kind of thing, right? But I'm kind of thinking about it all day. You're getting yourself primed. I'm getting my, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm doing in the day, I'm thinking about the fucking gym. If it's before, especially. So I could be doing a podcast. And while I'm talking to the guest I'm talking to, he may say something about his training and I'm like, yeah, I can add that today. Okay. Even just something small like that. Or I go to the grocery store to get food while I'm at the grocery store. I'm like, I'm kind of, okay. I got I know I got to go to the gym in like two hours. So let's get this groceries and get home, get my food and get ready. You're kind of, I'm kind of always getting myself ready. I'm always conscious of that workout, conscious of what exercises I have to get in and when, so that when I get there, I'm, I'm like a caged fucking animal. I'm ready to go. And when I don't feel that way, I know I need a, I need a day off because usually when I get to the gym, I'm ready to go. So it's a matter of your whole day is spent preparing. Okay. I know I want to do that exercise. Okay. How many hours I got? Okay. I'm going to get this meal in. I'm going to eat a little more carbs today. I know it's leg day. I want to fucking be ready. All right. How many time, how much time? Okay. There's only fucking hour and a half left. Okay. I better go fucking take a shower. What shirt do I want to wear? I got to wear, it's my fucking back day. I got to wear my back shirt. Okay. I know it's got to be a little longer because I'm going to be doing pull downs. I don't want that shit to come up and my, my stomach hanging out or my love handles hanging out or any of that shit. Okay. How much time do I got? Okay. I got a, I got half an hour time to get my pre-workout ready, get that shit down, get my ass to the gym. It's the, it's like a whole day of preparation before getting there and fucking unleashing hell. So there's nothing like I think specifically on the way to the gym. It's kind of like this little puzzle that's been formulating all day long until you finally get there and you just fucking explode. It's just the kind of way I've always done it. Okay. Wayne Barefield, Barfield asks. There's a lot of questions here. Okay, so how many calories do you think are good for building muscle without being a slob? Because he leaves his weight and his height and his body fat percentage. Okay, this is what I'm going to tell you. There is a Harris-Benedict equation that will help you put together your uh, your basal, meta basal metabolic rate, meaning the calories you need for the day. So go to Google and type in Harris-Benedict equation. And then fill in the blanks. Fill in your height, your weight, your age, all that shit, the way it says to, and do the equation. And it will tell you how many calories a day you need just to live. And then it will tell you to multiply by 1.3 or 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6, depending on your activity level. So multiply that number by the 1.6. That will give you your daily caloric needs, including your output. Take that number. And if you're in the off season, increase it by 200 calories until you start getting fat, 200 calories every couple of weeks. And then one week you're like, oh fuck, I feel like I'm getting fat. Take a step back, but always try and be in a surplus. If you're dieting, take that calorie, take those calories, the daily caloric intake, reduce it by 200 every couple of weeks, every week. Reduce it by 100 calories. Release it, release it, reduce it by 200 calories. And you'll see week by week with the added cardio and the reduction of calories, you'll start to get more and more and more shredded. It's not complicated to get shredded as long as you're starting with the right number. The problem people run into 
is they eat too little and then they try and reduce the calories from there and they end up starving and their body shuts off and they don't lose any weight. If you start with the proper amount of food, then as you reduce calories, your body will continue to strip, strip and strip and strip away fat. So, and as far as being a slob, look, if you, if let's say it says to eat 3000 calories. So you're like, okay, I'm going to eat 3,200. Okay, so you eat 3,200. The first week, say you put on a lot of weight because your body's like, holy shit, I'm not used to eating this much weight, this food. All of a sudden, I'm retaining a bunch of water. Give it a couple weeks. Let your body get used to the amount of food. As long as it's clean, you should get hungry. As you get hungry, as your body starts to flush out that water and get used to the amount of food, from there, you can go, okay, I'm going to add another 200. See how that goes. Do it for a couple weeks. Add another 200. Okay, I feel pretty good. Add another 200. Holy shit. I feel like I'm really watery this week and I feel like I'm getting like, I feel like I'm getting chubby and kind of getting washed out. Go back 200 and hang out there for a little while. That's all it takes. You don't have to keep increasing your food. You can't keep increasing your food. You eventually you're just going to get fat. So you, there has to be a number that's a sweet spot for your body. Let your body grow into that weight. As your body grows into the weight, then you can go, okay, I think I'm getting leaner at this weight. I'm going to increase 200 calories. Boom. Increase 200 calories. It's a slow process, but that's how it works.